guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are in the Gospels. It's super refreshing, isn't it? You know, we get to actually just dig into the life of Jesus Christ. You know, the one word that we have for Matthew is king. You know, Matthew 1, remember we talked about the genealogy, the family tree. In Matthew 2, we talk about the birth of Christ and all the prophetic words. And then remember the Magi and they go follow the star and the star then points them over the house. Not, remember, not the stable, but the house. (laughs) So an incredible, incredible story that we've been going through. Now, just yesterday, we had an opportunity to talk about Matthew 10, which was where Jesus is, he's charging, yes, 12 apostles to go take on a mission. What's the mission for the 12 apostles? Uh, To go look for the lost sheep. Yes. Now the lost sheep from? From the house of Israel. House of Israel, very specifically. So now it says this in Matthew 11. Okay, so now we're, we're transitioning, right? We're transitioning to Matthew 11, verse one. It says, when Jesus had finished giving orders to his 12 disciples. So he had just gotten done telling them, hey, by the way, I want you to go cast out demons. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to raise the dead. And I want you to do this all to the lost sheep. When Jesus got done giving these orders, and oh, by the way, don't take a money belt. Don't take sandals. Don't take a stick. Don't take any of that stuff, right? Short term, we're going to see this. So then they leave, right? And it says when he had finished giving orders to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Now these towns would be considered the Jewish towns in and around the Sea of Galilee, the Galilean area, okay? That's your backdrop. Everybody's on a mission right now. Now in verse two, it says this, when John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, Okay, John would mean John the Baptist, as he hears in prison about what the Messiah is doing. Uh, Kevin, can you go to Luke 3, 19 through 20? Let's just talk about how John the Baptist got into prison. I'm going to talk about John the Baptist more than I ever have in my life in this lesson today. Okay, so now in Luke 3, 19 through 20, it says, But Herod, the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him about Herodias, his brother's wife, and about all the evil things Herod had done, look in verse 20, He added this to everything else. He then, in the process, he locked John the Baptist up in prison. So now when John the Baptist gets locked up in prison, now I want us to go to Matthew 4, verse 12, okay? Word gets out, hey, John the Baptist, the camel-haired guy, literally the guy that's out in the wilderness, the wilderness of Judea, everybody's flocking to him, says this in Matthew 4, verse 12, when he, meaning Jesus, heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Okay, I want to say an obvious statement. John the Baptist, okay, has his image of who the Messiah is. He has his image about how the Messiah is supposed to live and breathe and function because his whole life is to prepare the way for this Messiah. So what happens is here he is in prison and he sends a message, okay? If you go back to verse two of Matthew 11, it says he sent a message by his disciples and look what they do. In verse three, and they ask him, so hey, disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, I need you to go find the Messiah and I need you to ask, are you the one who's to come or should we expect somebody else? Now, a lot of us could take this about John the Baptist and be like, does this guy not even know his own message? You know, like, why is he confused? A couple things about why John the Baptist needed clarification. One is that Jesus was in Galilee. He's not in Jerusalem. If you're the king that's coming and you're going to usher in the kingdom, what are you doing in a little community of the Galilee area? But as soon as John the Baptist got locked up, it says Jesus went to Galilee. So John the Baptist wasn't probably expecting that. And I think the the biggest thing is, is John the Baptist is confused because what did he say Jesus was going to do? And go to, if you would, go to Matthew 3, verse 12. Remember, he says, I'm not even worthy to tie him, uh, uh, tie his sandals. This is what what Jesus is going to be doing. His winnowing shovel is in his hand. He'll clear his threshing floor, gather his weed into the barn. But the chaff he's going to burn up with fire that never goes out. If I'm John the Baptist, I have this image of the Messiah. Like, it's fire everywhere we go. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's excitement. There's crazy fire. There's authority. There's power. But wait, he's not in Jerusalem? He's in, he's in Galilee? Can, can you go find out if this is the guy? Can you guys just make sure, the one that I'm preparing the way, like, can you make sure that this is the coming one? Now, there's a couple of verses in the Old Testament that talk about the coming one. If you would, Kevin, go to Psalm 118, verse 20, uh, verse 26. Psalm 118, verse 26. Okay, this is some of the verses that John the Baptist, this is some of the verses that, people would be expecting. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From from the house of the Lord, we bless you. Okay, keep going here in Mark 11, verse 9. This is the one that we're talking about. 
Then those who went ahead, here's the same language that reciting Psalm 118, but now in the, in the Gospels. Then those who went ahead and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now we know, what do we do at this time, right? People throw down palms, right? They're really getting ready for the king. Like this is the mentality that we have. The king, remember, is coming in to, to Jerusalem. And he's in Galilee and there's not a whole lot of fire falling anywhere. So I just think this is the mentality. And one more, Hebrews 10, verse 37. John just needed clarification. Hebrews 10, verse 37, just talking about the coming one. For yet in a very little while, the coming one will come <laughs> and delay. We'll get into that maybe just in a little bit down the road. So John is legitimately, I think he's, he's just confused. But he's not confused because of lack of faith. Does that make sense? He's not confused because he's like, oh, did I mess up? Did I get this wrong? Or maybe I didn't believe. It's none of that. He just needed to make sure, like, is this the one? That's all he's asking for. And in verse four, Jesus replied to John the Baptist's disciples. I would, I would love this. You go and report to John. First name basis. He's no longer using his last name. I want you to go and report to John, not John the Baptist. What you hear, what you hear, and what you see, both. I want you to use your senses. And so what happens is I want you to report back to your guy. Here, here's what you're going to report back to him. Tell him that the blind see. So he's not just, remember this, they have to actually experience this, right? So they are actually going to see the blind see. Why? Because it says you're going to report to what you hear and see. They are going to see, John the Baptist's disciples are going to see blind people see through Jesus. Jesus is going to basically, I don't know how else to put this, he's going to gather these, uh, these, these witnesses. He's going to allow miracles to take place to prove to John the Baptist that he's the Messiah. So in this context right here, these examples are solely, this is crazy for me to even say, they're solely for John the Baptist to know that he's the Messiah. That makes sense? To me, it, I'm like, wait, they had like their own personal tour with Jesus? And Jesus is like, okay, blind the sea, make sure you tell him that one. All right, lame walk, check, got this one, make sure you tell him that one. I mean, but in my mind, that's what he was preaching. And so now he needed to make sure that he saw this. And so those that have skin diseases, they're healed. Make sure you tell everybody that can't hear. Now you can tell them they can hear. Oh, by the way, Scripture says the dead are raised. At this point in Matthew 11 in Jesus' ministry, we don't know the names, but we can say the dead people came back to life. That's pretty awesome to me. And in all of this, the poor are told about the good news. It wasn't just this like healing show. It was a both and. They were physically healed and the poor even received the good news of the Messiah. So please, please go back and tell John the Baptist, you've encountered the Messiah. I, <laughs> I guess to me, uh, when I see and read verse 5, and I, I look at it with the lens of it's solely to bless, yeah, the people that have been a part of it, that being ministered to, but to speak to John the Baptist, whose whole life was committed to preparing the way for the Messiah. You know how cool that would be to be John the Baptist? And like, yeah, I, we got a report from Jesus, and he did all of this. And I, I actually believe, he, and he says hello. <laughs> it's pretty powerful to me. If you would, Kevin, can you go to Isaiah 29, verse 18? Isaiah 29, verse 18 and 19. You see, what's going to happen is, is that when the Messiah is there and present, the prophetic word from Isaiah says this, On that day the deaf will hear the words of a document, and out of a deep darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Verse 19. The humble will have joy, and after joy in the Lord, and the, people, the poor people will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Here's a prophetic word about the coming one, and Jesus just walked this out. These are words that John the Baptist would have known, and he would have looked for. And so Jesus made sure he addressed all of these different components. In fact, can you go to, it's going to be a little bit longer, but I always call it I-35. Can you go to Isaiah 35, verse 5? Isaiah 35, verse 5. Again, just want to show you the miracles that people talked about that Jesus knew John the Baptist would have talked about. It says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Verse six, then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Verse seven, 
The parched ground will become a pool of water, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, in their layers, there will be grass, reeds, and papyrus, verse papyrus, papyrus. A road will be there in a way it will be called the holy way. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for the one who walks the path. It's awesome. Even the fool will not go astray. Verse 9. There will be no lion there, and no vicious beast will go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk on it. In verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come to Zion with singing, crowned with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. You tell John the Baptist you just experienced a little bit of Isaiah 29 and Isaiah 35. Just tell him that you got to experience some of these words of the prophetic, that you got to see firsthand what the prophet Isaiah was talking about. And in verse 6, Scripture just says this, If anybody is not offended because of me, he is blessed. You know, I always reference, a, a, it's a commentary called Nelson's Commentary. When I went to Dallas Seminary, they, they always recommended it. It has the Old Testament and the New Testament. And basically, wherever you go in the scriptures, you can use this as, as a reference. And, you know, John the Baptist, he would have expected a couple things. He would have expected, and we've talked about this, immediate judgment on the fatherless Israel. He expected the fire to fall on this lost sheep. And so he didn't see this. And so then he even expected possibly an overthrow of all of Israel's enemies since they deserved it. But Jesus isn't doing those things. He's doing the things that the prophets were talking about. And the opposite that what Christ did is he was patient and then he showed mercy to those that he encountered. And so John the Baptist uh, has to decide, is this the Messiah when he hears these reports? To me, I think it's a pretty powerful message of how Christ communicates his life to somebody else. And in verse 7, it says, as these men went away, <laughs> hey, I, I think that was the Messiah. You know, like, I don't think they're going to be the 10 spies. They're like, no way, that was it. There's no way that was the land. No way. I think these are the two that say, yes, we have encountered what God wanted us to encounter. And as these men away, went away back to the prison to talk to John the Baptist, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John the Baptist. So he's describing to the crowds, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? In verse 8, what then do you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? Look, those who wear soft clothes are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and far more than a prophet. And in verse 10, it's like this whole chapter is just to, it's like to encourage John the Baptist for all of his work. This is the one who it is. This is the one it is written about. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. <laughs> right here, you guys, he's quoting Malachi 3.1. Kevin, let's just go there. Malachi 3.1, you're seeing, okay, we're going to get into this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a whole lot of time about Jonathan Baptist here, even more. You're seeing the fulfillment of Malachi 3.1. Okay, Jesus just referenced, see, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. John the Baptist, in his fulfillment, his role was to simply prepare the way. And Jesus says he did it. Hey, go, go, go tell John the Baptist, good job on Malachi 3.1, you walked it out. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome to be like, yeah, I walked out that prophecy. But we talked about this the last couple of days. Joseph, he did the same thing because he knew the word of God, because he knew that he had to come out of Egypt, because he knew that he needed to be in Nazareth. He knew the word of God. He could walk it out. He said the same thing about John the Baptist in Malachi 3.1. And then it says in verse 11, Jesus continues. He's talking to a whole crowd here. He says, I assure you, among those born of women, when Jesus says this, up until this point, nobody's greater than John the Baptist. And that's like the ultimate award, <laughs> the ultimate prize. When Jesus says there's nobody greater than, than this guy, he's currently in prison. But then watch what he says. Well, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. All right, you ready for all this? I'm going to do something here, okay? So you have Jesus. That's King Jesus, all right? Okay, King Jesus is over here. Let's just, I always, John the Baptist is over here, okay? At this point, Jesus just said, he's greater, 
right? Nobody is greater than him. But now all of a sudden, you know what he does? He says, I kind of, I kind of messed up my little thing. He says, the least in the kingdom of heaven is now greater than he. I, I think to an extent he's, he's tying what has been known as the old covenant hmm. and he's saying that because of the role John played, um, he is the greatest thus far, but there is a new kingdom that's okay. coming, and yep. those that are in this kingdom are, are far greater than the old covenant. Okay, so I want to write one more group, and this will verify what you just said. The prophets. What John the Baptist did is, is that John the Baptist, and I love this perspective, John MacArthur says this, he says, John the Baptist is greater than the Old Testament prophets because he participated in the fulfillment of what they were talking about. So Malachi prophesied that there's going to be one that comes. That was John the Baptist. Well, now guess what? Guess what? Now we're in a whole new playing field. We're in the kingdom of God now. We can enter in because of Christ. We then are automatically get to experience the prophetic word from the past. We get to walk into the new covenant, which makes us greater than John the Baptist. And I even love it. It says the least in the kingdom of heaven. So... The lowest of the lowest, <laughs> just barely making it into heaven. He's greater than John the Baptist. And I just think it's a cool image about how all of this keeps preparing the way for the king. So he tells everybody, by the way, <laughs> um, he's the greatest. But now through me, you can be the greatest. It's really cool to see. And then watch this. The scripture says this. In verse 12, this is where it gets a little weird. Okay. From the days of John the Baptist until now. Now, when you read this, it says now. So until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and the violent have been seizing it by force. You're kind of like, well, that's a real encouraging verse. So what does this mean? What does this look like? Well, first of all, if you're a prophet in the wilderness, okay, one commentator says, and I like this, he's naturally going to evoke emotions and strong reactions from the religious. Okay, he's going to, he's going to strike up, remember the brood of vipers mentality? The religious are going to rear their heads and they're not going to like at all what's happening. Herod didn't like at all what's happening. So what happened to John the Baptist eventually? Well, John the Baptist, I can tell you, Kevin, if you'll go there for me, Will you go to um, Matthew 14, verse 6? It got so violent. John the Baptist's message of the kingdom of God is near. Okay, it got so violent. Matthew 14, 6, it says, but when Herod's birthday, celebration came. It's one of the few times in scriptures you get to actually read about a birthday party. Herodias, his daughter, danced before them and pleased Herod in verse 7. So he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. And here's what she asked for, verse 8. And prompted by her mother, she said, give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Although the king regretted, he commanded that it be granted because of his oaths and his guests. Verse 10. So he sent orders and had John beheaded in the prison. Verse 11. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. I wanted to read through this graphic verses. Why? Why? Because in verse 12, it talks about the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and the violent have been seizing it by force. What you see is this ongoing tension of, and I'm just going to say it and call it out, the prophets, the legit guys that are declaring the word, they're not backing down. They're not stopping because the message needs to be heard. But at the same time, the enemy is coming at it and it's going to be violent as well. And I'm telling you, it's going to be, keep going like this until the kingdom is actually ushered in. Now in verse 13, I'll just tell you this, if it makes you feel better at all, when you study this in depth from all kinds of different angles and perspectives theologically, there's all kinds of different views on this. There's all kinds of different views. So take for what I have said as, as one of those views, and you're welcome to read more and study, but I really think that it's talking about both, both entities coming in and clashing and experiencing the violence because of the message the kingdom of heaven is near. Now it says in verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now, here's what they prophesied. This is awesome. In verse 14, this is where we get to camp out for the rest of the time. If you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. You will not find any more verse so clear 
that if the Jews would accept the message of the kingdom of heaven is near, guess what? The kingdom starts. The king, remember we talked about this yesterday, the king is ready, the kingdom is ready. He just needs the people to say, we accept, we receive. If you would receive this, then John the Baptist becomes the prophetic word that says he is the quote unquote second Elijah. All the Jewish people had to do was just simply believe. Then John becomes the fulfillment of the Elijah prophecies. It didn't happen. So here's the big question. Was John the Baptist the prophetic word, the fulfillment of Elijah? There's so many conversations out there. Is it or is this still an ongoing word? I'm going to give you and I'm going to walk through multiple lists here, okay, about what this looks like. Now, let's start off with this comes from uh, John MacArthur. He comes up with a list of biblical evidence, okay? So we're going to go all academic on you here for a second, okay? Number one, go to Malachi 4, 5, okay? One of the words is, look, here's the word. This is what everybody's waiting for. Look, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So in any circle, Christian or Jew, okay, we anticipate at some point Elijah the prophet's going to come, okay? How do we know if he's come or not, okay? Now let's go to... Go to Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, if you would. Okay, now in verse 11, uh, Matthew 11, verse 14, right? We're here today. If you're willing to accept the word, if you're willing to accept the message that John brought, then by the way, he is Elijah who is to come, which means you could literally stop right here and say Malachi 4, 5 has been fulfilled, right? But we know very clearly that they do not accept. Now, I'm not gonna teach on this. I'm gonna come back to this list here in a second. But on the rest of Matthew 11, 16 through 20, 24, all you get is an unresponsive generation. All you get is a group of people. It looks good. It sounds good. And yet they still say no. All throughout. Remember, we talked about this yesterday. Matthew 10 all the way up to Matthew 28. They just keep saying no. They keep rejecting King Jesus. But if you would have accepted it, then John the Baptist would have been the fulfillment of Malachi 4 or 5. It didn't happen. So now let's keep going here, okay? Go to number, we're going to go to number three on our list here. If you go to Matthew 16, 14, okay? It's pretty clear that in the time of Jesus, the Jews did not believe that John the Baptist was Elijah and that they were the same people, okay? They didn't believe it at the time. How do we know? Because we're going to get into this later on this week, but Jesus would say to, to Peter and his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, they'd say, hey, who do you say that I am? And these people would say, well, maybe John the Baptist, maybe Elijah. They would clearly make a distinction that they were two separate people. Okay. Now, when you go to when you go to this context of Matthew 16, 14, uh, again, there are because uh, we have the synoptic gospels because we have Matthew, Mark and Luke. What you have is, is you're going to have uh, different uh, just as an example, go to Mark 8, 28, because I'm not going to do this for every one of these. But if you go to Mark 8, 28. You're going to have the same story just from a different perspective. Mark 8, 28. It says they answered him, John the Baptist others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. And so they clearly made a distinction that John the Baptist was separate than Elijah, even though Jesus is asking, who do you say I am? But they're still making that distinction that, that, that they are not the same. Now, uh, number four, Kevin, if you would, would you go to Matthew 17, three? Okay. Matthew 17, three. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Okay. If you'll go to Mark nine, verse uh, I think it's four, Kevin. It's either four or verse nine. Okay, Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus, okay? Keep going here. Uh, go to one more, Luke 9, 28. What you're gonna see in this context here is that Elijah and Moses both appeared at the Mount Transfiguration, okay? About eight days after these words, he took along Peter, James, Peter, John, and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. And then who did they interact with? They interacted with Moses and Elijah, right? And Jesus, okay? So this is some of the angles, some of the support that people would have on was John the Baptist Elijah? Well, in this context, Elijah just actually showed up and it wasn't John the Baptist, okay? It's a conversation that some theologians would have to make their argument. Okay, uh, I'm gonna write Matthew 17, three, emphasizing the Mount Trans Transfiguration. Kevin, we go to, this one's a big one. We go to Matthew 17, verse nine. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anybody about the vision until the son of the man is raised from the dead, verse 10. So the disciples questioned him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Verse 11, Elijah is coming and will restore 
everything. So remember, based on Malachi, everybody's anticipating Elijah to come. He replied, verse 12, but I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they didn't recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Now here it is in verse 13. Then the disciples understood that Jesus was talking about, that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. Now go back to verse 12. Okay, do you understand this? Elijah already came. That Elijah right then and there was John the Baptist. Okay, the second quote unquote Elijah was John the Baptist. And we've talked about it today in Matthew 11, verse 14. He came, if you would have accepted the kingdom of God that's at hand, then John the Baptist would have fulfilled Malachi 4, 5. It hasn't happened yet because the Jews have not accepted the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. And so, uh, man, there's so much more here. Just because of time, I'm, I want to emphasize in Matthew 27, the Jews understood the Lord's cry heaven, heavenward as a cry for Elijah, okay? And because Elijah didn't come, then the Jews don't think that he was Messiah because Elijah didn't come, okay? So that's, that's one of the arguments. Again, because of time, I'm not going to go there. Uh, in Luke 1, 17, an angel of the Lord, he announces to Zacharias that John the Baptist is going to minister in the spirit of power, uh, of the spirit and the power of Elijah, and some sense of fulfillment will take place, but obviously not the complete fulfillment. Okay, everybody with me on this? Okay, I think, I, I just want to write this down, Matthew 27, 47 through 49, and then we just mentioned Luke 1, 17, and then finally, this is crazy, but if you, we got to go here, John 1, 21. John the Baptist himself denies. They say, hey, what then? They asked him, are you Elijah? And he says, I'm not. He said, are you the prophet? No, he answered. And so here you have, very clearly, John the Baptist stays in the lines of Isaiah 40, verse 3. Can you go there, Kevin? Isaiah 40, verse 3. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. This is my role. And he quotes Isaiah 43. Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make, straight, make a straight highway for our God in the desert. That's my call, and I'm not getting out of the lane. Now, obviously, if the Jews would have embraced Matthew 11, 14, yes, Malachi 4, 5 would have been and come... Uh, into, into fruition. So what do you do with all this? <clears throat> well, <laughs> John MacArthur has a verdict for it. One is, is that John the Baptist is an Elisha type only. He's a type, right? We, we know what that means. He, he's not complete, but he's a type of Elijah. Number two, John partially fulfills, we've already said this, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Malachi 4, 5, and 6 will be fulfilled literally at some point when the Jews embrace the message of the kingdom of God. So here's John the Baptist, you guys. That is a, a lot on John the Baptist, Matthew 11. But again, my prayer is that some of this is, maybe there's a little, a nugget that's new for you. I know that's happening to me. There's little things here and there. You're like, man, I haven't seen that. And then he starts putting that together. That's my prayer, is that we study, study the 66 books of the Bible and they all these little pieces start coming together to ultimately they paint a, a, a complete portrait picture of the Messiah. All right, guys, thanks for listening in on gospel lesson number 11. Thanks.